Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining the British Chambers of Commerce webinar on Latin America. This is the fifth webinar in our series, uh, and what we're looking to do is really try and help understand what are the opportunities in Latin American markets, and more importantly, how you might be able to access these opportunities. My name is Marilee Sarbini. I'm based at the London Chamber of Commerce, which is one of the 52 accredited chambers in the network here in the UK. The British Chambers have asked me to chair this webinar on Latin America. So I will just give you a quick introduction to the session before handing over to our speakers who are on the ground in British Chambers of Commerce and uh, business centers in Colombia, Chile, uh, Mexico, uh, and Brazil. Um, so over the next 45 minutes, we will look at the Latin America region. We'll have a quick regional overview, followed by some brief market overviews and insights into the opportuni opportunities available in these markets before moving on to a Q&A session. So the British Chambers of Commerce uh, here in the UK work with British Chambers of Commerce and business groups based overseas in markets around the world. And uh, uh, if you'd like to connect to any other markets in any other regions or in other parts of Latin America, please do get in touch with us. So as I said, there will be a Q&A session at the end, but you are able to ask a question at any point. Um, just use the question box in the control panel on your screens and we will run through these at the end. Uh, if we can't get through all of them, we will get back to you offline, so don't worry about that. Also, don't worry about taking notes because this is a recorded webinar. It will be available uh, shortly afterwards on our YouTube channel as well. So without further ado, I will pass over to Ben Brown in Colombia, who is going to give us a quick regional overview. Thank you very much. Um, so if we, uh, if we come to the regional overview of Latin America, if you could please move to the next slide. Um, the question as to why Latin America seems a little strange from somebody who's been living and working in Latin America for so long, uh, particularly given the, the, the enormous um, scale of the opportunities for UK companies for export, and particularly given the context uh, or historical context that the UK has in terms of uh, commercial links with Latin America. The UK traditionally has very strong commercial links with Latin America, and if you come back to the, the years of independence back in the 1800s, the UK had about 40% of all exports to the region, um, and in many cases, uh, in terms of historical and, and, and cultural, uh, with historical and cultural factors, the UK was actually on the supporting side of independence movements within countries like Colombia, um, so we're on the right side of history in that sense. Um, today, unfortunately, the, uh, the situation has changed, uh, perhaps because of cultural reasons. Um, I know certainly talking with a number of UK companies, UK clients, uh, that people often feel that it is easier, or that the perception is that it is easier to look to traditional UK markets where people already speak English, or where there are historical ties thanks to the, uh, to, to the empire. Um, but and currently, Germany is exporting or has four times more trade with the region than the UK, which means that we are tremendously underrepresented. Uh, under which means that there is a huge potential for, for UK, UK growth, particularly given that there are over 589 million consumers in this market with a tremendous growing middle class as well and greater consumer spending, which means that there is a tremendous amount of scope in different sectors. The cheaper overheads and costs uh, in, in Latin America compared to Europe, um, as, long, as well as a, a, a great base of young, qualified, uh, motivated workers also means that there is a, a, a great deal of untapped potential in this region. And with, protected, uh, with a, project, a projected GDP growth of over 3%, which is over twice that of the Eurozone, uh, we would really like to encourage more UK companies to start taking this region more seriously. Moving on to the next slide. Um, the next slide should give us a better idea of some of the some of the, well, a slight snapshot into some of the microeconomic reasons. If we look in terms of the three countries that are being discussed today, you'll see that there is a great, uh, or that each of these countries have considerable populations, Brazil obviously being the first at over 206 million, Mexico following with just under 200 million, Colombia with 46 million, and Chile at 17 million. And between 2014 and 2013, you can see that the average GDP growth in these regions has, uh, has always been above 3%. Um, Brazil has obviously been a star performer in the past, uh, in, in, in the last 10 years, uh, but it's also important to note the other countries uh, in the region that have also uh, posted tremendous uh, uh, growth. 
Um, also, it's interesting to note that it's very easy or relatively easy to do business within some of these countries. Not every country is every country is different. Um, and also, Latin America suffers from traditionally lower levels of corruption compared to Asian markets, which I know are very popular uh, in the news and the media. Moving to the next slide. So, the, obviously, we have the, the Latin American region here. Uh, we have four business networks. Uh, to help you and make uh, the process of exporting and coming to these countries a little bit more easier, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, uh, and we hope that we can go into greater depth within these, within these countries as the webinar goes on. As we then move on to Colombia, very conveniently, if you could go straight into the next slide, please. Um, I know that, unfortunately, uh, for and various reasons, Colombia has often suffered from a negative perception uh, amongst the British public. Uh, and I'm very pleased to say that this perception is now changing. So whereas people uh, two, three years ago would often, the first if I mentioned that I was working or living in Colombia, the first thing they would obviously mention were uh, perhaps political instability or perceptions of political instability, uh, drug trafficking or violence. Um, this really doesn't match the actual reality on the ground. Um, and many of the UK clients that we bring across are very, pride, are very pleased to see that the, uh, that the situation is completely different to uh, uh, perhaps some of the news stories that you'll, you'll see in popular media. So Colombia is an extremely interesting market, a very dynamic market, and it's also, it's, it's, it, it, it is, it's posted uh, close to 4% GDP growth in the past uh, three years on average, and in 2015 is expected to post growth of 5% GDP, which not only makes Colombia the fastest growing economy in Latin America, but potentially the fastest growing economy in the entire world. We also have low inflation at 2%, the official language is Spanish, and we have a very large population as well. I'm very pleased to say that we have a colleague uh, from Chile on this webinar today who will be talking about Chile, which is a another tremendous and very interesting market. Um, and in many ways, we hope that Colombia will become a Chile of the future. Um, if you look at the, 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 the great um, success that Chile has achieved commercially, uh, we feel that Colombia is on the same trajectory. So if many UK companies had really seen the trend that was uh, starting in Chile maybe 10, 30, 40 years ago, and had been able to get in as the wave was rising, as the, as the wave was rising. Uh, this is in many ways similar to the situation that's affecting Colombia today. Colombia is beginning to take off, really beginning to grow. We have uh, disposable income amongst consumers has doubled in the past uh, or since 2000. Uh, the middle class is expected to double in the next 15 years. So there is a tremendous amount of opportunity for UK companies. Foreign direct investment is actually from the UK uh, accounts, or well, the UK is the second largest foreign direct, in, uh, direct investor in the country. Uh, we're ranked number, we have the second largest Spanish speaking population in Latin America. And we are now ranked number one in all of Latin America for ease of doing business. If you looked at the, the four top countries in terms of ease of doing business last year, it would be no surprise to know that they were all Pacific Alliance countries. So the Pacific Alliance, for any of you who have not, uh, who, who, who have not heard of this, uh, this, this, this alliance, is essentially four Pacific facing countries that all have very similar economic uh, outlooks. So they have tried to bring down barriers, they've tried to make it easy to do business, they've tried to further integration. And this is the reason why Colombia has so many free trade agreements signed with various regional partners and international partners as well. Most importantly, in, uh, from, the, from the point of view of, uh, of British companies, we have a free trade agreement with the European Union, which uh, certainly brings down the barriers for, for doing business. And this is part of the reason why Colombia is now one of 19 priority markets for the UK government for uh, uh, British companies going forward. So if we could please uh, move to the next slide. Um, there are challenges uh, to Colombia. Uh, Colombia is still obviously developing. Um, there are uh, infrastructure problems. Um, these are obstacles, but they're certainly not reasons why business is impossible. Um, you'll often find that the cost of internal freight from the coast to Bogota, for example, is actually higher than the, the freight from the UK to, occur, to the Caribbean port or from China to a Pacific port. Uh, but our recommendations would be to be friendly. Um, to make sure that you examine and you have a, a well thought out plan. This is a, something that I think would apply to, to most markets. Um, and what we normally suggest to our clients is that um, it's best to make a, a, an initial visit so you can scout out the market, you have a better idea of how business is done, you have a better um, uh, concept of the competition that you'll come up against, um, an idea of prices, an idea of how people consume, uh, uh, an idea of how their business is, uh, is perhaps spread around the market. And that means that when you come in for the second time, you might be better prepared um, with prices, a plan, um, and also having a, having a better idea of which, which partners you would ideally like to do, to do business with. Um, there is also um, perhaps for cultural regions, um, 
uh, it can take a little bit longer get, to get business doing, uh, but at the same time, I've heard from many of our clients that uh, they are presently surprised by how efficient and hardworking Colombians are, and that they do get back to their emails uh, very quickly. So as we move on to the next slide, please. So the main growth uh, sectors uh, in Colombia we would highlight is being infrastructure and transport, oil and gas, retail, financial and personal uh, and professional services. So in terms of infrastructure, unfortunately there has been a historic low investment in infrastructure with poor maintenance and at times low construction standards. Uh, the government has taken great steps to remedy these problems um, and is currently investing 3% of GDP into infrastructure projects, which essentially amounts to over $100 billion uh, of investment by the year 2020. Um, Colombia also has looked towards Britain for ideas and guidance in setting up uh, private, um, uh, public and private partnerships, PPPs. Um, this means that there are Colombian PPC, PPP schemes that, uh, that have, a, have a mass of $41.6 million in, in, in projects. It means that the public or the state is willing to fund up to 20% of the total cost in many cases. And in some cases, they're giving 30-year concessions, um, including extensions of public building processes um, and encouraging private initiatives. Going on to oil and gas, Colombia is the third largest oil and gas, uh, oil and gas producer in Latin America. Um, production actually increased by 87%. Um, into, uh, between 2007 and 2007, and there is a tremendous amount of potential for offshore ex uh, exploration, especially given that only 24% of Colombia's maritime area has actually been um, uh, uh, explored. Offshore opportunities, um, around 60% of Colombia's uh, potential crude oil reserves lie under the sea, for example, and uh, this is particularly where the UK has a tremendous amount of experience and expertise that we feel would uh, tremendously benefit uh, Colombia and allow for uh, British uh, commercial success. Uh, retail is another a considerable area for, for growth. Uh, Bogota is the second largest luxury market in South America. Uh, and what people don't understand or many people don't realize is that Bogota itself has a, a higher GDP than many regional countries such as Uruguay, Costa Rica, or, or Ecuador, just the, just the city itself. Um, the retail market is growing at over 20% per year. Um, Bogota is the second largest luxury market outside of Sao Paulo in Latin America. 40% of all sales in the country come from retail. Um, we're, number, we're ranked number 18th in the world in the world's retail index, and 40% of Colombian households would be considered or could be classified as, uh, as, as, middle, uh, as middle class. And this is the reason that more and more UK brands are flocking to the country, uh, such as Burberry, Mothercare, Hackett, Hunter Wellies, Church of Shoes, Diageo, Weetabix, Brompton, Basement, or Barber Jackets. Then coming finally to financial and personal services, um, the UK currently has a 6% market share, uh, with 50% of British exports being made up by the service industry. Um, there are a number of big players who are already in the market, so for example in banking and finance we have HSBC, insurance we have JLT, Willis Howden, and Lloyds of London is also aiming to, to set up an office in Colombia in the near future. We have auditing, fir auditing firms such as Deloitte, PwC, Ernst Young, and legal services such as, uh, as Norton Rose. The insurance market is growing at 12% year on year, uh, which is essentially being driven by the growing, young, vibrant, dynamic population, which is increasingly demanding more sophisticated and updated uh, uh, financial services. So we please move on to the very last slide. We have case studies with uh, companies that we've worked with, such as Huechos, uh, with whom we are currently working to help them find uh, um, contacts uh, with some of the largest supermarket players in the market. Um, so if you're looking for testimonials, um, we have a very uh, good one from, from Waitress at the, at the bottom. Uh, if you could please move on. Um, and I believe that would be uh, our last slide. Um, so I will pass to my colleague Andres in Chile. Oh, sorry, I have one last slide. Um, so how can, we, how can we, we help you? Very briefly, before you come to the market, uh, we can help raise awareness of your business. We can help provide fresh market knowledge uh, in the form of, of uh, market development reports or OMSs, the equivalent in the, the UKCI network. Uh, we can make contacts and relationships. We can help you launch new products and services. And then when your product is actually in market, we can also help to promote the, your brand, services, and products by organizing events or trying to, trying to spread it with word of mouth and through our various media and UK Columbia trade. So if you move on, I can pass on to my colleague Andres, who will be talking about the Chilean market. Thanks a lot, Ben. Uh, my name is Andres, and I work for Britain Business Services in the British Chilean Chamber of Commerce. 
Today I'll give you a brief overview about Tele, its most important economic sectors, and general tips and opportunities. Moving on to the next slide, please. Well, as it can be seen in the map to the left, Chile is located in South America's southeastern coast. It borders Peru to the north, Bolivia to the northeast, Argentina to the east, and the Pacific Ocean to the west. While Chile is far from being the largest economy in Latin America, it's widely regarded to be one of Latin America's most stable and prosperous countries. Liberal economic policies maintained consistently since the 80s have contributed to steady economic growth, low unemployment, controlled inflation, and reduced poverty levels. Chile leads Latin American nations in rankings of human development, competitiveness, income per capita, and economic freedom. Since July 2013, Chile is considered by the World Bank as a high-income economy and therefore as a developed country. In this sense, um, Chile is widely considered to be one of the safest London countries for entrance to the Latin American market. Moving on to the next slide, please. Regarding Regarding the main sectors of the Chilean economy, um, regarding the main sectors of the Chilean economy, mining is the main pillar of it. Chile's mineral wealth has been historically exploited by both the public and the private sector. The latter, the latter, currently taking about 70% of the total market share. Mining in Chile is so large that it represents 11% of our GDP. It accounts for roughly 60% of our exports and employs 12% 12, 12 of the country's workforce. Chile is the world's largest copper producer with nearly a third of the global output. Copper alone in Chile accounts for 90% of the mining GDP and 91% of the mining exports. Some of the mining sector's most relevant challenges include, first, the compliance with environmental norms in protected areas and the continual communication with local communities, which is paramount for the approval and seamless executions, execution of all mining projects. Another challenge is to increase competitiveness and productivity through new technologies and labor training as a way to counteract the growing energy prices. Then again, this is also an opportunity for several companies, especially coming from the UK, the US, and Europe in general. Uh, moving on to the next, the next slide, please. The second largest sector after mining is agribusiness, which accounts for 10% of Chile's GDP. The sector is largely, largely diversified and comprises three broad activities, agriculture, fishing and aquaculture, and thoroughly food processing. Chile aims to become a food producing superpower. Currently, it's the world's 16th largest food exporter and aims to be within the top 10 by 2019. Today, Chile is the world's leading exporter of grapes, blueberries, and plums. It, it ranks second in avocados, cherries, fish meal, trout, and salmon, third in frozen fruits, fourth in kiwis and apples, and fifth in wines. Some, some challenges for the sectors include, firstly, the fact, the fact that there is a relatively small number of key players, which can limit, to some degree, the possible deals and arrangements which can be made with distributors. Secondly, there are some technological challenges, especially for the medium-sized companies. However, I would say that this also means an opportunity for external providers. For example, while traceability technologies are being increasingly used by the main food producing companies, the small and the medium-sized companies are lagging behind to some extent. In the next slide, we will focus in retail. 
retail in Chile is largely developed in its supply and consumption, consumption of several brands for every category of products. Chile's retail market was worth above 60 billion in 2013, and it is expected to keep growing at about 14% over the next four years. In 2014, Chile was named by AT Kearney as the best emerging market in the world for retail opportunities. Um, it should also be noted that Chileans in general tend to associate British products with quality and prestige. This can be a very strong advantage for UK companies, especially, especially in retail. Um, however, there are some challenges that UK companies need to consider. For example, connecting with the local market, particularly, especially when it comes to selecting a, the most appropriate distributors for any given product. Secondly, it also needs to be taken into account that while retail in Chile is developed and highly competitive, there is still a large space for potential growth. Consumer goods in the health and wellness and also the luxury areas, for example, are expected to grow faster as Chilean salaries continue to rise. In the next slide, we will see a flowchart which basically illustrates one of the main services we provide for UK companies. In particular, it summarizes one of the works we did for a British company working in the pharmaceutical and chemical industry, which was looking to enter the local market. We delivered a comprehensive list of potential distributors with a report of each company and also a market overview of the sector in Chile. Once the UK company received the report, it decided to come over to Chile to meet up with some of the local distributors in person. We accompanied them to some of the meetings in order to assist them in any way possible. Currently, the company is in the process of selecting the most appropriate distributor. In all of this process, we were making sure to assist them in whatever they needed. In the next and final slide, we will see some of the main reasons why UK companies should invest in Chile. Firstly, <clears throat> we have a very low corruption and our culture is considered to be highly contract compliant. I would say that Chileans are straightforward in negotiations and normally get written confirmations on agreements. Secondly, like I said before, there is a very positive perception of UK goods and services. This is, of course, very relevant in the retail sector, but also applies to other sectors in other industries. Thirdly, Chile is highly open to trade. We are widely considered to be one of the most open countries in the world, and to this extent, companies are usually eager to get access to new products. Among the top tips I would mention, in the first place, while electronic communication is universally used, face-to-face -face meetings are usually crucial to do business. That will mean coming to Chile in order to make and or to close a deal. Secondly, punctuality and formality are highly valued in our business culture, more so than in other countries of Latin America. However, a light initial conversation and a bit of humor are always appreciated. Lastly, distributor agreements and high concentration might be barriers to entry in some markets. Bear in mind that Chile is a relatively small market where relationships in the business community are key to success. The selection of an appropriate agent or distributor is extreme, extremely important. For further information about Chile, I will be happy to assist you. Please, don't hesitate to contact me at my email below. Many thanks for your time, and now I will pass you on to Laura from Mexico. Okay. 
Hello, thank you very much for that, Andrew. Um, okay, so just to quickly summarise um, a bit about Mexico and what we can offer. Um, just to start with, obviously, we're the second la uh, largest Latin American country, but I think the most important thing you need to know about Mexico is that we share 3,000 kilometres of border with the United States. And with a, such a large population, many university educated, um, that is a big advantage for most companies um, looking to do business in Latin America and with the US. Uh, we also have um, free trade agreements with 44 um, countries, which is more than any other country in the world. So it's very much open to trade in Mexico. And some of the really strong sectors in Mexico are aerospace, automotive, manufacturing, um, energy, education, and healthcare. And um, finally, another point that I would really like to point out, something I would like to point out that's very important for this year, is that both our government and the Mexican government have named 2015 the Year of Mexico in the UK and the Year of the UK in Mexico. That means the spotlight is on the UK right now in Mexico. We have various exhibitions, newspaper articles, trade missions coming in. So. England or the United Kingdom is very much in fashion right now in Mexico. So if you're thinking about doing business with the country, I would say 2015 would be a good year to get started. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, please, um, so I know we're shorter on time. Um, so just uh, having a look at some of the success stories in Mexico. Uh, we mentioned I mentioned energy. This year there was a big opening up of the energy sector in the country, which has meant um, lots of uh, UK companies coming in, both in renewables for power generation and looking to do business in oil and gas with the national comp company Pemex, which is now inviting private investment. Um, we also have some other examples of recruitment, Pangea Cosmetics, we have a growing middle class in Mexico, uh, which means that there is a much larger market which is consistently growing for these types of luxury goods. We can see brands like Burberry, uh, Tiffany's, all of those sort of um, names are, are very much here in the country and they're doing well. Um, just because I know that um, in the webinar right now we have a lot of people from education and manufacturing, my colleague Rosanne is just going to quickly mention a couple of points about those sectors. So. Hello. Um, so starting with education, it's that there's, there's a, a sector that has a lot of opportunity, especially for UK companies. As Laura's mentioned, Mexico has a large population. It's also a very young population, which means it's ideal for the education sector. Uh, English language training is also very much in demand. So we've had some very successful companies, for example, Little Bridge, which is an English uh, language teaching software. Um, British Council is also very successful here in Mexico. And in December, we successfully linked it up Oxford University Press with a suitable distributor for, for one of their products here. Um, we have a very strong uh, education group in our chamber here, which, which has allowed us to put people in touch uh, and link up uh, distributors, manufacturers, um, uh, and service providers. There's also been a lot of work going on in the education sector between UK Ofsted and the closest equivalent here in Mexico, which is INE. Um, they've been working together to work on the evaluation of teachers, schools, and students here in Mexico. Um, so th these are just a few examples of how the two countries are working together in the education sector. Um, for those of you in the education sector, you may be interested to hear that there will be a large exhibition called Guess Mexico. So that's global education supplies and solutions. That will be from the 15th to the 17th of April in Mexico City. And the Chamber will also be organizing the third edition of Education Day. The date's to be confirmed, but it's likely to be May or June. And as for manufacturing, I was actually in Expo Manufactura yesterday, a manufacturing exhibition in Monterrey. Um, a few of the companies I met there, the British companies definitely are represented. Some companies such as Dellcam, um, who op offer CAD CAM software solutions, Domino Printing Sciences, and Renishaw for sensors and calibration systems is, is very big here in Mexico. This exhibition will also take place next year, and I, I know that our colleagues at Monterey 
um, the, the embassy in Monterey will be having a stand. So if you're interested, please send us an email and we can put you in touch with them. There will also be another exhibition um, for manufacturing here in Mexico City called Expo Tecma. That will be early in early March. So again, if you're interested, please send us an email and we can help send you more information. I, I think that's it on those sectors, so I'll pass back to my colleague Laura to finish. Okay. Great. Okay, so we just have a look now at the next slide where we're looking at some of the challenges and some of the tips for doing business in Mexico. Well, obviously in Mexico, the, the official language is Spanish. Um, while formal business people do speak good English, it is important to bear in mind the, uh, the need to do all your labeling and official documentation in Spanish. That's by law. However, in the British Business Centre, we can help set you up with translators or any support you might need in that area. Um, it's a very sophisticated business environment. There are several large kind of business hub cities where we've seen a lot of public investment in pushing forward certain sectors. Uh, a couple that come to mind would be aerospace and automotive, but there are, very, uh, there are a few more actually. So you do need to plan your visit well in advance and be prepared to travel within the country. However, it's also worth mentioning that there are plenty of flights that go from London Heathrow to Mexico. I believe there are three airlines that offer flights various times a week. And there's also plenty of internal communication in terms of flights within the country. Um, also, please don't expect uh, people to want to sell your products for free. Uh, you will need, um, or on a commission basis, you will need to offer them something that will make it worth it for any import or distributor to sell your products. There is competition. We are close to the United States, so you do need to up your game. However, there is still a market for your goods, and the British brand um, is very prestigious here. So I think distributors are prepared to sell your goods. They are very much prepared to work with British companies, but you need to give them something in return. Um, personal face-to-face -face contact is essential. Um, again, mentioning the flights and the coming for meetings, I think being able to build up a relationship with your partners and having a good connection will help you. Um, so some of the tips that we have is um, definitely visit the market, get to know the market first and come in person um, so you can find your own reliable partner and meet them in person because that will help form trust between the two of you. Uh, please do not think of Latin America as a block. Uh, Mexicans like to be called Mexicans and not Latin Americans and Mexico is in fact part of North America. Um, also, when you're thinking about your pricing strategy, please bear in mind any commissions or expenses and marketing budget. Often people will not know what your goods are. While there is a huge influx of products from the United States, British goods are often new and unknown. So you will need to do some marketing to make sure your product sells. Letting people know that your product is British will always be helpful, as we've seen with success stories from companies such as Lush here in Mexico, where the owner has told us herself how, how helpful the British brand was for her company. Um, in terms of logistics, it shouldn't be too difficult. However, it's always very helpful to have an expert um, in the country helping you. Often trying to save money by making cuts on these things, you end up spending more in the long run. And um, finally, you can take advantage of uh, our mentoring services uh, through the British Business Centre. We can put you in touch with others who have gone before you, and you can try to learn from their mistakes, as is always very helpful. Um, so uh, finally, I think it's also worth mentioning that while we are not the British Chamber of Commerce, we are very much part of the British Chamber of Commerce, uh, which has a network of over 400 members who we can put you in contact with. And while we're talking about the importance of personal communication and face-to-face -face contact, the network of the British Chamber of Commerce will be very helpful to you. So it's always good to go through this route into the market. Um, and also, without exaggerating at all, I would have to say that the British Business Centre offices are some of the fanciest offices in Mexico City in one of the most exclusive areas. So that will definitely give you prestige and you're very welcome to use our facilities. Please just get in touch with us at the email address is given. I know Rose mentioned some expos coming up in manufacturing and in education. However, the energy sector, the aerospace sector, we're seeing creative industries, we've also got retail. We have lots of events and lots of activity coming up in those sectors and we're very happy to give you more information about those events so that you can really make the most of your visits to Mexico. So please just drop us a line and we'll do whatever we can to help you. And so now I'll pass back to Marilise. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon from Brazil. Just to give you a little bit of background information, um, without going through all the detail on this next slide, on this slide, 
I'd just like to reinforce that Brazil is a country of over 200 million people. It is currently the seventh largest economy in the world. Um, it is a net foreign creditor in terms of the fact that its foreign currency reserves are over two, uh, $350 billion. It has an economy of about $2.3 trillion um, and represents the seventh largest economy but and will eventually grow due to the populational dividend over the next 25 to 40 years to be the fifth largest economy in the world no matter how it's no matter how that uh, economy is is measured uh, be it current purchasing power or in nominal terms um, one of the benefits of Brazil is we don't have border conflicts we don't have major natural disasters although we do have suffer rainy seasons from time to time and I'll come on to that uh, and also Brazil is a melting pot very much similar to the United States in terms of the ethnic backgrounds to the population of Brazil. However, we still suffer from social inequalities. Uh, there's underinvestment in education. Uh, the judicial system is slow. It still is a bureaucratic uh, company, country. We have higher interest rates, a complex tax environment, um, and we also do suffer from infrastructure gaps. And from a UK point of view, the challenges that we have in Brazil do represent the opportunities and within those niches for UK companies. Uh, just to highlight on this next slide that Brazil recently uh, did achieve a 7.5% growth in GDP per annum back in 2010. So uh, the economy can grow at Chinese rates. But since 2010 through to 2014-15, that growth has reduced to about zero. So at the moment, we're in an economic situation where interest rates are, are, are increasing. And they're currently just over slightly 12% per annum using the government prime rate. Uh, the inflation rate is higher. It's over 6.5%. Um, and it's expected this year to be 7%. We've had delays in the infrastructure projects which have been announced and you no doubt would have heard during the World Soccer World Cup last year that some of the football stadia were, were, were finalized and finished leading up to the beginning of the World Cup and in some instances during the World Cup as well. Um, and in addition at the moment Petrobras which is the, the state controlled um, national oil company Right, is currently going through a major investiga investigation into political corruption. And also in 2013 there were some street protests by the middle class which were started by the university uh, students and grew during a, a three or four month period. Uh, they died down last year in 2014 and given all of the above that we've talked about just now on this slide, we're waiting to see what's going to happen in 2015 with the discomfort that the middle class are beginning to, to feel more hardly uh, during 2015. So we're waiting to see what's going to happen. Moving on to the next slide. All right. The mood is one of concern but not gloom. Uh, Brazilians by nature are always optimistic and look to the bright side rather than the pessimist side. Uh, we have a new finance minister who was appointed uh, in January. Um, he's fiscally astute. Um, he's announced some budget cuts and, and has announced that over the next few years there will be an intention to, uh, to balance the fiscal budget. So austerity in Brazil is a new macroeconomic word which has not been used for the last 12, 13 years. Um, so there is a right sizing that's going on in the economy at the moment. That said, I mean Brazil is still a huge economy and a huge country. And any company which wishes to call itself a global player must be present in Brazil. Um, otherwise, there is a risk of being left behind over the next 25 years or so, whilst the potential and the populational dividend comes through. 
Uh, there is some uncertainty in 2015 regarding the Petrobras scandal. Um, and again, that is a sector where the UK is very strong in the oil and gas and the oilfield services sector. Um, and at the moment, there is a strong British presence in this sector. So it's something which the UK is following closely. And despite the fact that we're in a tropical country, 80% of the electricity in Brazil comes from hydro sources. And we're currently, believe it or not, going through a drought um, that affects the southeast of Brazil uh, and the central region of Brazil despite the fact that Brazil has 25% of the world's natural water resources. Um, so it's a question of watching this space, especially in Rio and Sao Paulo. So as I said, uh, the mood is one of concern after 10, 12 years of, of stronger growth and very optimistic years, but it's not gloom and doom in Brazil. And to put it into context, Brazil is a country where the UK must increase its, its profile and its presence as the Brazilian economy will eventually become the fifth largest economy over the next couple of decades or so. Also, we've got to remember that the British um, in the early 1890s, 1900s, were big players in the investment in the infrastructure, and that's something which is not particular to Brazil, but to other countries in, in South and, and Latin America. There is a strong tradition for the British being um, present in the infrastructure area, and that still represents one of the biggest opportunities going forward. Likewise, agribusiness, Brazil is um, a major exporter of agricultural products, uh, especially on the, the meat and the soya, um, and that, and also the research and development in the agribusiness area is something which Brazil is, is also quite advanced, and there are niches where, where the UK could bring its expertise uh, to bring to bear in, in agribusiness. Embraer is another company, it's in the aerospace sector, um, it's either the fourth or fifth largest airplane manufacturer in the world now. Um, it's a major exporter in Brazil. Uh, but likewise, Embraer is a global player, so it, it does um, buy in all the parts and the services. It assembles the plane in Brazil and then exports the final product. So it is a global player. Uh, there is an aerospace uh, cluster in São José dos Campos, just outside of Brazil, just outside of São Paulo, um, and uh, it is a large cluster, and there are plenty of opportunities for the for the UK aerospace sector uh, to be a supplier to Embraer. Life sciences, um, Brazil is one of the largest pharmaceutical markets in the world. Uh, in the life sciences sector, Brazil is known to be a leader in the human genome research. Um, and there are um, clusters within Rio and Sao Paulo um, that operate in the life sciences sector, also tying up with the Brazilian universities in terms of the research and development. Um, interestingly, uh, Brazil is one of the largest markets for the genetic uh, pharmaceutical products. Uh, we've seen a lot of investment, but not much by British pharmaceutical companies or research institutes. Uh, but we are beginning to see more opportunities coming through uh, through the UK university system, uh, dialoguing and forming research partnerships with some of the Brazilian universities. Energy, oil and gas, and marine. Um, we've put that on, on as one integrated opportunity. Um, Brazil has a benefit of huge oil reserves um, in what they call the pre-salt uh, pre layer, which means that the, these oil reserves are very deep. Um, they're in the deep sea, and they're also underneath a salt layer um, under the seabed. Um, and they're approximately 11, 7 to 11 kilometers uh, below the sea surface. 
Um, and the whole integrated chain of, of the exploration and um, lifting of the oil um, under the command of Petrobras and its joint venture partners um, represents a huge opportunity going forward that despite the current situation, the, the, the investigations into Petrobras with its, with its contracts, with its suppl major suppliers, um, the, the investment over the next three to four years runs into the hundreds of billions of dollars in excess of $250 billion. There are currently 29 uh, drilling vessels and platforms which are being built in Brazil, um, and they are being, when I say being built, they're being assembled, uh, but all the parts, um, despite the national uh, local content regulations, there are opportunities there for, for suppliers to come in and, and, and supply the construction of, of the parts. And likewise, the oil field services, you know, once the drilling rigs are, are in production, there's going to be the whole servicing uh, of these uh, going forward. Mass transit, for those of you that have been to Rio and Sao Paulo, uh, will have experienced uh, the traffic problems that we have in these major cities. Uh, Sao Paulo is a city of 20 million people. Uh, we only have five or six uh, metro lines. Um, we have um, certain blackout periods during the week when you're not allowed to use your car, depending on the number of the license plate. So the mass transit and an intelligent city sector um, is an opportunity as well. And Brazilian cities, as urbanization continues in Brazil, the major cities all along the coast primarily uh, will, represent, will bring forward many opportunities in the mass transit sector. Uh, you've got to remember that Brazil has 20 cities with populations of over a million people. So it's not just Sao Paulo or Rio de Janeiro, but it's some of the major regional capital cities as well where the opportunities arise, which means sort of having a look at the map of Brazil um, and, and choosing you know, your port of entry. It's not necessarily uh, the most obvious places like Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. And Rio de Janeiro. Uh, likewise, this, this current slide we're showing with a map of Brazil within the, the, the borders of the country, uh, we've highlighted the major cities um, within Brazil, but also some of the sectors which present good opportunities for the United Kingdom. And the purpose of this slide is to show, A, the size of Brazil, but B, the numbers of potential points of entries by geographic or regional basis, and also the drilling down which is required in order to see what the opportunities are within those regions and or cities. And they are diverse. It covers global sporting infrastructure in Rio and Sao Paulo. In 2016, we've got the Olympics. Most of the Olympics has already been planned. The construction is underway but some of the back-end services are still being contracted, and the UK does represent you know, strengths in that area, so there's still opportunities there. Um, another example is in Campinas, up, up town, upstate Sao Paulo, the agribusiness. Moving on, in terms of the practicalities about doing in Brazil, in Brazil um, you'll see it starts off with all the P's, patience, um, and you'll uh, see patients more than once. Um, we are a Latin country. We are in Latin America, as has been stressed previously. Um, but patients, it does take time to establish a relationship in Brazil. Flying in for two or three days and expecting to form a relationship and leave with a long-term contract um, is not the way things work in Brazil. Um, it is a relationship-based economy. Uh, so forming the relationship will take a little bit of time. You need to be prepared. You need to be passionate about your product and your company, and you need to be passionate about forming the relationship. You need to plan because it will take a bit of time. Um, it will not be able. You can't come into Brazil ordinarily and in two or three months 
you know, create the relationship, create the strategic plans, create the contracts, um, and then uh, start exporting to Brazil. It is something that is a long process, uh, and it's a relationship-based process. Destination target, that goes to the port of entry into Brazil. How do you come into Brazil? Um, which region do you choose? Um, rather than looking at the country as one country as a whole. The language, uh, we are Portuguese speaking in Brazil. It is not Spanish speaking. Um, most Brazilians at the business level will understand English, but will be reluctant to speak English um, out of fear of making errors. Right, so you have to break, break the language barrier and form confidence, um, and then you'll be able to, to do business in either language. Um, skill shortages and employment legislation. Uh, the employment legislation means the way business is done here in Brazil is very different to the Anglo-Saxon world um, in terms of um, assuming responsibilities and flexibility by members of staff that you're dealing with. Uh, so there will be referral up the line to what the director or the general manager will, 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 will approve. Uh, legal and tax issues, um, following up on strategy after you've visited Brazil, you'll need a good lawyer and accountant. And all that means that we get back to the initial point, again, that you need patience in terms of establishing the relationship and forming partnerships Brazil. And the final comment I will make is, Yes, it is not an easy market, and you will no doubt have heard stories about how difficult it is to do business in Brazil. But remember, it will eventually, Brazil will eventually be the fifth largest economy in the world. Right? It will take, make use of its populational dividends, um, and if you want to be a global player, uh, you have to be present in Brazil in some shape, form, and manner which means practicing the patience and developing the partners and preparing your plans, right, and making up your follows up strategy to continue to visit Brazil in order that you can form your partnerships in Brazil. Just for anybody who is listening who would actually like to connect with the British Chamber in Brazil, you can find their details on the Export Britain website, uh, along with the details for Colombia, Mexico and Chile as well uh, as this presentation being available online afterwards. We are very close to the end of time, but I think it's worth taking a couple of minutes to go through some of the questions that we've had come through. Um, just to go to Laura in Mexico, we've had a question. Are you able to provide more information on the aerospace companies in Mexico? Yeah, yes. Um off the top of my head, um, I know that there are companies in Saltillo, Sonora. I can just um, get, well, I, I, yeah, I'd be very happy to. Could I have the email address of that person? Because I could tell them that there's quite a few British companies established in the country. Most of them are in Querétaro, Saltillo, and other states to the north. I'd be happy to provide a list of the UK companies here if this company that is asking the question is supplying to those companies or any other information, and also about the aerospace. If they could please, or if you, Marilyn, they could give me their details, uh, I could call them straight after this, if you'd like. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Laura. That's really good to know. I mean, I know this is what this is uh, this is your bread and butter. This is what you guys do. You connect companies here into the right distributors and the right supply chains and clients on the other side. So uh, we will follow up on that. Uh, just, Laura, whilst we're with you, uh, just one question. You mentioned the British Chamber of Commerce in Mexico and the fact that the British Business Mexico is very much linked to that and very close to it. Um, the members uh, that you mentioned, are they generally Mexican companies or British companies or an equal mix? Um, I would say it's quite a mix. I'd say we have a lot of British companies, obviously, who are members, but as is the case, I think, in all countries, usually the the actual members of people who are coming to our events are, are Mexican, the British companies. Um, and we also have a lot of Mexican companies who work well with British companies. Lots of suppliers to British companies are also members of the British Chamber of Commerce, which I think would probably be similar in all the other markets. That's a guess. So, yeah. That's, that's a good guess. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, ben, back to you on Colombia. Um, 
we had a question. Could Ben speak about corruption within the logistics sector in Colombia? Uh, we're interested in developing a road cargo business, but are worried about cartel protection issues. Um, that's a very good question. Uh, Colombia ranks, uh, doesn't actually rank that highly uh, in terms of corruption. If you look at the kind of world corruption index, Colombia is a kind of in the medium, uh, in the middle of the pack. Um, and I think, as I briefly mentioned in the webinar, that uh, compared to other Asian markets, we're actually very good in terms of corruption. That's not to say that it doesn't exist. It's not to say that it isn't a consideration. Um, but it's maybe not as bad as, uh, as perceptions are outside of the country. Um, in terms of uh, specific corruption, uh, I think it would be important to note which regions that you're working in. Um, there are still um, there are there are still uh, problems that are, are leading from the internal conflict that we have. We have inter we still have a, an ongoing peace process that has been negotiated in uh, Havana and Cuba. Um, mm -hmm. If that peace process is signed, for example, that will take away a lot of these corruption um, uh, problems that you may have for your business. And it is also expected to add an extra 1% or 2% onto GDP growth as well. Um, if you actually look at, uh, in terms of population or consumers that are affected by uh, perhaps some of these issues with paramilitaries or, or cartels, um, you will find about five or six percent of uh, of consumers are actually located in areas that are affected by this. So the the the, the Colombian government has made tremendous uh, strides in uh, winning back land or, or taking control and securing a large part of the country, so that now most of these troubled areas are on the peripheries of the Colombian uh, country. So you'll find them towards the borders of Venezuela, or perhaps towards the borders of Ecuador. Um, these are away from uh, large municipalities where most British businesses will be doing business. Great, thank you for that. That's a, a very good uh, immediate answer and I'm sure the asker can uh, get in touch with you for, for more details if they'd like to go into more details about where they're particularly thinking about operating. Uh, one final uh, quick question for Andreas in Chile. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that there is this growing e-commerce e market uh, taking off in Chile. Uh, we've had a question from a company which is trading with over 50 countries um, uh, online in e-retail, uh, is, there, is there real scope? Is that taking off now or what's, what's your view on the potential for e-commerce in Chile? Yes, um, yes, that's an interesting question because I would say that, uh, well, retail, while it's growing strongly, it's not really as strong as it is in Europe or the US, obviously. But then again, it is catching steam and it is growing at a fast rate. 70% uh, of Chileans who use the internet, for example, made between two and six online purchases in 2013, and the average household spent about 160 60 US dollars per year online. This is not that much, but actually the retail market in e-commerce is expected to keep growing fastly. Uh, right now, most of the Chilean house households have access to the internet, and my perception is that initially buying online, um, well, people were a bit distrust distrustful about it, but nowadays it's a lot more common, especially for the younger generations, and, and people are starting to to buy more and more from the commerce market. I could probably give you more data about this if um, I could have an email, and mm -hmm. I'll be happy to, to give a, a, a better report of, of the situation. But uh, overall, the e-commerce market is certainly growing. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Andreas, and we'll be sure to uh, connect to you after this. Uh, okay, well, we've reached the end of our time, uh, and we've uh, gone over by a few minutes, so I will wrap this up, and I will thank Andreas, Laura, and Ben uh, very much for their time and their insights, and thank you to all our listeners as well. Uh, just to wrap up, um, you can visit Export Britain, which is, uh, the link is up on your screens now. Uh, on Export Britain, as I said, you can connect to these British chambers of commerce and business groups based overseas. You can also connect to your local chamber here in the UK. And through that, you can access a wide range of international trade support, whether that's 
through these British business networks overseas or through uh, UK trade investment, the government support. And actually, I just received a tweet during this webinar um, saying that the UKTIE exporting program is uh, really useful in terms of this e-commerce that has topically come up with Andreas in Chile, and, uh, and there's no doubt important across all your markets. Um, so UKTI can provide an advisor and help with trademark or tax registration. So do, do go and check that out online. Uh, just to uh, flag again on Export Britain, you can find details of uh, events and trade missions going out to market um, for these particular markets. I know that a few of the Latin America partners will be over in the UK towards the end of this month. Uh, they will be doing a Latin America roadshow at various different locations, so you can check that out on the events page of Export Britain. And uh, actually there's a trade mission going out from London Chamber to uh, Colombia over to Ben uh, very soon. Uh, there's still a chance to sign up for that, I believe, so you can check that out on Export Britain as well. Uh, just a reminder again that this uh, has been recorded so you can access the information uh, from this webinar later on. And finally, uh, before we sign out, uh, when this webinar ends, a window will pop up on your screens with just a couple of questions. Uh, it would be great if you can answer them for us to make sure we give you the best possible follow-up. So on that note, thank you.